بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We always praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon every condition we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his entire household, all his companions we ask Allah to bless them all and to bless every single one of us to bless our offspring, those to come up to the day of Qiyamah, to grant us steadfastness and to protect us, to keep us on the straight path and to keep us from amongst those whom he is pleased with and to make us from those who can understand the importance of living within the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I am indeed humbled by the great numbers that are attending here this evening. It is my first time in this particular uh, town, if I may call it, and the people who are here, as much as I may not know you personally, but I feel there is a bond. The bond is that of Iman. We have the bond of the Shahada. We probably have a few differences in likes and dislikes and a few other matters, perhaps, you know, you may like a pizza and I may not like a pizza, but you are still my brother, believe me, or my sister. And if we ever happen to sit together on a table, I might not eat what you will be eating, but you are still my brother in the deen. And believe me, if anything goes wrong, I will be the first one to stand up, inshallah, to protect you. And I'm sure if something happens to me, you will also be from amongst the first to get up and to help. May Allah accept that from us. Brothers and sisters, the topic I was given is, O oh, Ummah, unite. The importance of unity. We can speak about unity from so many different angles. Some people, the minute we say unite, they develop a rash. And you find that they start scratching. And it becomes worse because they don't like the word unity. They think we cannot unite. It's impossible. It's impossible. We cannot unite because you are Hanafi and I'm Shafi'i. It's impossible. We are not going to see eye to eye. Believe me, people are small-minded. Remember point number one. We are the creatures of Allah. Did you hear that? To start with, we are the creatures of Allah. So we need to understand what is the meaning of unity when it comes to the various categories of creation and categories of people. I am in unity with the entire creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in what way? I need to understand that. I'm not trying to promote something silly or clandestine that will put my iman at risk. No, but I'm telling you, if there is an animal that is suffering, it is up to me to make sure that I do whatever I have to, to alleviate the suffering of a dog, subhanAllah. Do you know that? It is part of the compassion that I have. So the level of unity with entire creation would firstly start with compassion, to be able to have a feeling for the creatures of Allah. If you see the ecosystem and the forest is being burnt and there is a huge forest fire, if you contribute towards adding to the fire, you are sinful because you are destroying the creatures of Allah, the ecosystem, the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you are to try and extinguish the fire in order to save the trees for them to fulfill the role that Allah has placed for them in our ecosystem, you have understood this issue of living together with the other creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I cannot say I am a human being, so I need to kill all the birds, I need to kill all the things that are not human because I am the human and I am the only human and we are human beings, so everything else is by the way. If that is our thinking, we will not be able to exist because a fool is the one who thinks that I am the only species that is allowed to exist or has the right to life. Even the plants have the right to life, according to Islam. What about vegetation that we eat? SubhanAllah, today someone asked me a question. I would like to be a vegetarian, not because I have anything wrong with the Islamic laws and not because I disagree with eating of halal meat and beef, but because I have read so much about genetically modified foods and so on, that I feel at this particular time, all chickens and all beef and lamb and everything has been modified to the degree that it is unhealthy for me. Would I be wrong only if I were to choose to eat vegetables for that particular reason? And obviously the answer is something else. You might want to know it because everyone starts saying, well, the reality is I think most of us 
would not be able to make that sacrifice. It's a health matter. It's a health reason. When the doctor tells you no more red meat for you, a lot of people would actually stop eating red meat. So would we be able to say that it's haram, you have to eat it? No, it's not haram to eat red meat, but it depends why you are not eating it. That is the answer. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. So the point I'm getting to is, look, vegetation is plant. It's the plant family, but we are at peace with it. Or we will tolerate it as best as we can. When a tree grows in the middle of your driveway, you may need to say Bismillah and cut it off. Allahu Akbar. Why? It's a tree, we love it, but it's in the wrong place. Or you buy a property and you'd like to build a house. You might say Bismillah, Allah has given me permission to do this. Let me now remove this tree from this particular place. And I know I'm not doing it destructively, but very constructively. May Allah grant us goodness. So this is a certain issues are being spoken about or regarding certain matters we will be united regarding other matters perhaps we may not this is what we're trying to get at and this is why we say we start off with the creatures of allah the plants and then the animals we cannot just say you know what i'm a human being and this is an animal or it is a dog i'm supposed to kill every single dog that is there that is wrong that idea is wrong there is a system in place of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually taught us through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do you know that the marine life in the seas and the oceans, that too is supposed to be protected by myself and yourselves. If we have waste being offloaded into the oceans, that is something sinful because you are killing the fish and the fish if the fish is being killed and if the ecosystem is being maimed through an action of ours, then we definitely are guilty of doing something that is in the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah grant us goodness. Imagine eating fish that tastes like acid. And imagine so much fish that is required today to serve a global market. And we find that this fish is no longer in existence because someone somewhere has thrown depleted uranium or whatever else it is into the oceans or an oil slick was allowed to go through and it killed up so much that today we have no fish. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Now let's get to the humankind. We are human beings. From amongst the humankind, what do we need? I need oxygen, so do you. I need a place to live and so do you. I am in a country and I live in a non-Muslim country and so do you. And I am definitely a person who needs to survive, who needs to live, who needs to earn, who needs to do certain things that are in common with every other person around me, Muslim or not Muslim. For example, we were driving now to Luton, mashallah, there was a lot of traffic. Sometimes there is courtesy on the road and sometimes there is no courtesy on the road. Sadly, the Muslims, and this is, I'm seeing perhaps, don't hold me against it, believe me, I don't mean bad, but I see so many beautiful smiles here, mashallah. The Muslims are guilty sometimes of being less courteous than the non-Muslims. Why? Because they have understood for this system of the road to work properly, we need courtesy. I need to allow people to get in sometimes, even though I might be in a little bit of a rush, because they too could be in a rush. So if you have Muslims and non-Muslims on the road, you cannot say, I'm a Muslim, I'm never going to give way to that enemy of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't understand that. We are living in one country, we need to be in sync when it comes to certain items in order for us to survive and for them to survive. And if we do fulfill our duties correctly, they will be attracted to what is it that is making us fulfill this duty so powerfully that tomorrow they will be in our masajid. But the way we operate, we have sometimes closed blinkers. Sometimes we are being bombarded by people who say we are very knowledgeable. You know what? You are in one shell. You live in that shell and everyone around you is not worth even living. Don't greet them. That man is astray because he said one word in his life that I don't like. It's over. So because he's astray, believe me, you must make a big deal about it and throw him out of it. Brother, he made one mistake in 30 years. Subhanallah, that is a world record. That is a world record. Subhanallah. Why don't we think? Because when it comes to work, we would have to sometimes work and we probably the bulk of us are either working for non-Muslims or we have non-Muslims working for us. 
or we have colleagues who are non-Muslims. Perhaps 99 to 100% of us. So we have so much in common. May Allah protect us. If a fire were to start, may Allah safeguard us somewhere around. Allah safeguard us. And if the Muslims were being, for example, affected by it, who will rush to our help first? Believe me, those who are living nearby and the firemen. Religion becomes irrelevant, to be honest with you, for a moment. It becomes irrelevant for a moment. Why? Because humanity becomes relevant now. Are you following what I'm saying? So if someone tries to think for a moment, hey, we are not united because you know unity, these people are like this and those people are like that. Today I saw, for example, someone who appeared to be a male from a distance and perhaps maybe as they came closer, I was told, hey, that might have been a female. I said, and it could have been a male a little while back. <laughs> but to be honest with you, to be honest with you, really if you had to be, if, you, if Allah had chosen for myself or yourselves to meet up in a huge accident and that he or she or shahi who was there, believe me, if they were there and you met up in an accident and you really needed help, I am sure they would have come to your help. And what they were would become irrelevant for a while. And what you were would be irrelevant for a while. Imagine you are gasping for something and a person looks at you and says, Oh, this guy's got a beard. Ha! And they actually push their head straight on to put their, their leg on your head and they make sure you're now completely gone and they walk away. Do you really think that would happen here? I don't think so. I think they would rush to your assistance. And in the same way, if you see others who belong to your human species, who are struggling or suffering or have suffered in some way, you need to understand you belong to one species. You need to understand this. So when we say we are united, to be honest with you, we are not talking of unity plugged in upon every single level of unity. No, but upon the level that it is required in order for us to fulfill our duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the most befitting way. This is what we're talking about. So this is why I say, and I give the example of the road once again, because it's common sense and even of your workplace. That if you were to be traveling on the road, thinking that we are not in unity with the others because of X, Y, and Z, you would never be able to get from point A to point B. Never. And the roads would be chaotic and everything would be a mess. Why? Because you haven't understood how this network works. But because I need to get from point A to point B, and whether I like it or not, there will be people on the road who are Hanafis, who are Shafi'is, who are Salafis, who are whatever else, subhanAllah. They will be non-Muslims, they will be Christians, they will be atheists on the road. They will be courteous to me and I will be courteous to them. Why? I need to get from point A to point B. On the train that I jump into, for example, sitting right next to me, might be a person really whose beliefs are up the pole, if there's any pole. But the reality is I may ignore that for a moment because at this particular time, all I need to remember is I must carry myself in a way that even without talking, there is a message that goes to that person that I follow something divine. And then I know that I need to get to point B. Before I get to point B, my message is somehow delivered even without speech. And I walk out in a way that I've achieved and they have learned something from it. This is the broad mindedness of Islam. This is what Islam is all about. Today, there are people who have a warped thinking and they think for a moment that, you know, when you see a non-Muslim, he's an infidel and an enemy who does not deserve to be alive. To be honest with you, our forefathers somewhere up the ladder were not Muslim. How did they accept Islam? If this was the attitude, they would have been murdered in cold blood a long time ago. And one wonders where we would have been. So that understanding is, believe me, not in sync with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught. But we are taught that every non-Muslim is a potential Muslim. In fact, so much so that some of the scholars call them not yet Muslim. <laughs> not yet Muslim, which means I have so much hope that these people will see the divine beauty of Islam. We worship our maker alone. One of the most powerful points that really bring people towards Islam is the point that we worship our maker alone, alone without any association or partnership. That is what is drawing the people to Islam. 
That is the main point when I put my head on the ground. They say, why do you do that? I say, whoever made me deserves that I put my head on the ground for him. Subhanallah. And that's why I say, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. I am glorifying my Rabb. Who, what is the meaning of Rabb? The one who made me. The one who is in absolute control of every aspect of my existence. He's called Rabbun. And I say, he is the highest when I put my head to the lowest point. This is what is drawing people to Islam. And this is why we say, when we reach out to humanity in the correct way, we automatically attract them to the powerful message. Some of us are too shy. Astaghfirullah, we should not be. But some of us are too shy to tell others that, look, my brother, I'm a Muslim. I'd like to invite you to Islam. Some of us are too shy to say that. Some of us really would prefer that we are not even recognized as Muslim. Why? Because we don't have enough knowledge. Our Iman is weak. And we don't realize that my brother, do not be shy to say my name is Abdul Aziz. Abdul Aziz. You know, I met one brother, Abdul Aziz. I asked him, what's your name? He says, Ziz. <laughs> I said, Ziz, people don't want to hear this name. Why don't you say your real name? He says, Abdul Aziz. I said, that sounds much better. Subhanallah. We cannot keep on pretending like we're not Muslim because then perhaps we may jump out of that fold. May Allah not do that to us. The reality is, if we live as a Muslim, even if we have not had the courage, na'udhu billah, to tell someone whom we're working with, or who works for us, or who's a colleague, that look, my brother, I want to introduce you to Islam. The mere fact that we have good character, good conduct, we are courteous, we reach out to them in a good way, we will automatically soften the hearts of people. Look at those in Far East Asia. The bulk of them, how did they accept Islam? Go and see the books of history through honest business people. They went there to do their business and they were powerful Muslims. So they did not compromise their salah and their honesty. When these saw those, they immediately thought, Subhanallah, look at this. I wonder what is drawing them to this beautiful, powerful way of theirs. When they found it's their faith, they decided to join it. How many of us have that amount of confidence in ourselves that we will live a life so pure and so good that when others see it, I am confident that they will think about the reasons behind my goodness and they will point at Islam and if not enter it, at least their perception of it will be corrected. How many of us? To be honest with you, that number needs to grow. I need to improve and so do you. We can all do much better than we are. And this is why when we say unite, we are not talking of complete plug-in for everything because your Gmail account and mine is different, believe me, and your female and mine are also different. <laughs> Allah grant us goodness. It's a reality. You know, sometimes you say, brother, we are not united. So the, if we were to say, brother, we need to unite, then some, comes some wise crack and he says, that's impossible. You can't do that. You know, we're talking of a subject that really is a waste of time because we're going to be fighting forever and ever. You know what? He's a deviant. Whoa, whoa, relax. Take it easy. You're using heavy words. My brother, do you have a correct concern for the deen? If you do, well, you need to understand that there are categories of unity. Never ever will two people be in sync completely even if you are married. Believe me, if you are married, sometimes you might be in more sync at the beginning of the marriage than later on. So it happens. But you have your privacy and so do I. You are entitled to it and so am I. I am entitled really to whatever I, Allah has blessed me to be entitled with and so do you. So I need to understand this. However, as best as we can, there are different categories of unity. Like I've said just now, we've spoken now about the plants and the animals and the human beings who are not Muslim. Where? We will reach out to them as best as we can. And to be honest with you, we who live in non-Muslim countries have a duty over and above the general duties. What is the duty? We need to showcase this beautiful faith in a way that really portrays the correct image of the deen. That is what it is. So if we look at a non-Muslim and in our hearts we feel for a minute that this person does not deserve to be alive, wallahi we are wrong. Wallahi, we need urgent help. We need to rectify this ignorance in our head because we need to be thinking like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa where 
when he saw the enemies, he made dua to Allah. Allahumma a'izz al-Islam bi ahad al-Umarain. Oh Allah, here in Mecca, two people are really powerful people, not Muslim. And if you look at it, the harm that they have, the harm that they have actually beamed against Islam is quite great. One of them was Umar ibn al-Khattab, later to be known as radiyallahu an, and the other was Amr ibn Hisham or Abu Jahl. The Prophet says, Oh Allah, grant strength to Islam by the acceptance of Islam of one of these two. And in a very short time, here comes Umar ibn al-Khattab with a beautiful declaration of Shahada. So if we were to look at him and say he doesn't deserve to be alive, what would have been the reaction? If we look at Khalid ibn al-Walid when Rasulullah spoke to his brother in Medina, and asked him about his brother, he says, where is Khalid? Allah will bring him to us. Imagine, this was a man who had massacred Muslims. And here comes the Prophet and he says, Allah will bring him because he is so sharp, he is so intelligent, he cannot be ignorant of the fact that what we are believing in is what is right. Subhanallah. Ma midru Khalidin yajhalul Islam. The Prophet says, a man like Khalid, so powerful, so intelligent, he cannot be ignorant of the correctness of Islam. And shortly after, you find Khalid ibn al-Walid coming to declare his shahada in Medina Munawwara. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness. So this is why we say this perception of people wanting to harm those whom we live with just because they happen to follow a different faith is actually very, very cowardly behavior. And it is incorrect because the, those whom we are supposed to be inviting to Islam, and to be honest, a lot of them are considering Islam quite seriously. How then can we imagine for a moment that I am supposed to eradicate these people here solely because their faith is different from mine? May Allah guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors and grant us understanding. That person has no knowledge, no wisdom, and no patience whatsoever. Because the hadith of the Prophet says, Wallahi la an yahdi Allahu bika rajulan wahidan khayrun laka min humurin na'am. Wallahi, for Allah to guide through you or your effort, for Allah to use through you, to guide through you, a single person is better for you than the most valuable of material items of this particular world. What was used in the hadith was humur in naam a type of a red camel that was the most expensive of the lot at the time. It's like me saying the latest BMW, for example. Imagine. And this was at the time of war, at the time of Khaybar. The Prophet ﷺ tells Ali, Ibn Abi Talib, anhu, Ali, you are going right now, you're going to cross into this fort right now, but remember, if Allah uses you to guide even a single person, it's better than everything you have. Or it's better than Humur and Naam. Amazing. And today we sit in a beautiful country where we can read our salah, where we can live as Muslimin, and we want to spoil that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. But worse than that, my brothers and sisters, is when we take a step further. Amongst the Muslims, we feel hatred in our hearts for someone else because he raises his hands in salah. I hate him. Why? Did you see what he does? Come on, man. They ask me, what are you, my brother? I said, I'm a Muslim. But come on, what are you? What are you? I said, what do you mean? I'm a Muslim. What are you talking about? We don't want to divide people beyond that. My brother, you say, I mean, aloud, I love you. You say it softly, I love you, my brother. Subhanallah. You know what? The hatred we have amongst us is such that rather than discussing through a knowledge-based seminar or perhaps education, we choose to point fingers of hate and to tell those who follow us, you need to hate everybody else who does not think exactly like me. And for that reason, we've become small little groups such that today on the globe, the enemy no longer needs to do anything. No, they just need to sit back and relax and need to watch how one group kills another and the other kills that one. And this one blasts the other one and this one does that. Why? Because we are ignorant. And we have lost that feeling, not only amongst the Muslims, but even in humanity at large. May Allah grant us a deep understanding. We have become so foolish that we fall prey to those who preach hatred. 
when someone gets up and speaks very fiery and loud and you know and we are in that mood for some reason we've just had a battle at home so there's social unrest in our own backyard and we're sitting now in the masjid and the imam says they are kafir those people are kafir they are murta and we get excited yeah they are man so now so now what happens is we've got 500 points in common but because the poor man did not say his amin aloud for example he says assalamu alaikum we say Tah. What do you mean? I, I greet him with assalamu alaikum. Just make a hand sign and walk out. Why? Because I've been fooled and conned by someone who preaches hatred. That's the reason. If I want to discuss the matter, I can sit down with the brother or I can have a seat with a few others. Let me say my peace. You say your peace, subhanallah. We may sometimes not be united on one small point, but that does not mean you're not going to get electricity, subhanallah. You know when you have an extension? When you have an extension, subhanallah, and you have four or five different plugs that can go into the extension, sometimes one doesn't work, but you can have electricity from the other four. Does it mean you take the whole extension and throw it out? No. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. My brothers and sisters, this topic of unity is so vast that if we were to understand it today, what do you know about the details of the people of Syria? The reality is very little. But the goodness is the fact that they are in need and they utter the shahada. Have we not reached out deep into our pockets to help them? But they are different. I've heard some people saying, these are Arabs, you know, they're all in the nightclubs on Edgeway Road. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> One man told me that if the Arabs who are in the casinos have to stop gambling, they will not need our help for Syria. And when I looked at him, I said, my brother, don't ever say that again. Why? It shows that Allah does not want your money. That's the thing. Because if you could reach out for your 50 pounds, 20 pounds, your money would be somewhere in a good cause. You know, it would be in a good cause. But because you're thinking like a devil about what others should or should not do, you're forgetting what you should or should not do. This is what it is. They might correct themselves. How do you know? They might have already repented and donated millions and billions to do so many other things. Subhanallah. They might have... To be honest with you, we helped in the billions and we are still sitting saying, no, those people are astray. They've got so much money, they don't need it. We teach that to our children. The children are sitting together and suddenly we see someone, perhaps, you know, I'm not too sure of what goes on here in Britain, obviously, but what I would know is across the globe, we see someone who's different, perhaps from Africa, perhaps a person with a darker complexion, with a different accent, you know, and something, anything else. And we start saying, oh, those people just leave them, you know, they're astray, they're dirty people. Those are not, believe me. Like the Sheikh said before me, we tomorrow could have a flood in Europe. It could happen. It has happened, for example, a tsunami took place somewhere else. An earthquake happened in Pakistan. Did you reach out? The answer is, well, maybe. We don't have an excuse. We must reach out at least through our dua to start with. And thereafter, just give out something. Come on, subhanAllah. Look at the Sahaba of Allah. They gave out 100% of what they had. Some of them 50%, some of them 25%, some of them so much. We are not even going to give an amount that will be considered a percentage of what we're worth. If any one of us takes out, for example, 100 pounds, say every one of us takes out 100 pounds, the adults from amongst us, I do not think it would be equivalent to any percentage of what you are worth as a human being in monetary terms. Not even a percentage, but we find it hard. Why? Because that hundred quid I need to go to roast because they're opening in E17 now and I'm going to save that money and that's where I'm going to eat. So your little lamb chops for one day could have moved the lives of the Syrians, for example, in leaps and bounds. Sacrifice it. Tell friends we were supposed to go, for example, here. Today, all the money is bringing it along. We're sending it, for example, to these trustworthy people who are going to be doing the humanitarian aid for us. Yes. When we get involved in the politics of it and so on, sometimes we might have differences of opinion. Like I said, today if you were to ask people what's happening in Egypt, there are one of two things you can talk about. You can either talk about the politics of it, where everyone will have their own say, depending on how, what they've been watching, which TV channel they've been watching. And if you talk about the humanitarian catastrophe, everyone will have the same thing to say. So we are here to concentrate on the latter, because I'm not a politician. I can make dua, Ya Allah, help those who are correct. And Ya Allah, those who are wrong, guide them and help them to stop. And if you have not written guidance for them, then deal with them in a, ma in a manner 
that will stop that oppression somehow. Allahu Akbar. But we are talking about reaching out to those innocent people who are homeless today, yet they had more wealth than myself and yourselves put together. Just yesterday. There are people who owned more than myself and yourselves. People who had huge companies that were manufacturing things. Today, they are living in refugee camps. They don't even know where their children or family members are. We will reach out to them, won't we? Because we are united with them. Oh, Syria, we are united with you. Allahu Akbar. We will reach out to you as best as we can. We ask Allah to protect us from any form of calamity. But we know for sure that the day something happens to us, Allah will send people to help us. There was a flood in Jidda a few years ago. And I remember one man, a friend of mine, who told me, that, you know, here some of us far little, but some of us a little bit more. May Allah protect us. So we are quick to point fingers at others. But listen, when the floods came, there was a Pakistani black belt karate expert who had just come there six months earlier and he opened a little or he was working in a small what they call a bigala which is a little suprex like convenience store and when he saw the floods he closed his place and he sat at a high position and he saw all his cars starting to actually go sink into the water he jumped in pulled out one person put them to safety he jumped in again pulled out another person like that he jumped in 14 times and he took so many people out of the cars and the vehicles. And this was all caught on CC TV. And later on, the 14th or the 15th person, he tried to pull them out. Something happened. He was stuck under a pole and he was martyred. What happened? This was seen by the entire nation. And it was seen by the leaders and those who were led. And it touched their hearts. And it changed perception so much so that in his region back in the rural area of Pakistan, they built a masjid on his name. They cleared up the streets and tarred them up for that tree, for that particular man. The same street that all this happened on in Jiddah. The name changed to his name and so on. So many things happened after he went away. The point I'm raising is, did he sit back and say, wow, these people, Allah sent punishment to them, you know. I'm so happy they used to come in and say, the Pakistani, khalas roar. The Pakistani, he didn't say that. Everything became irrelevant. The insults became irrelevant. The perceptions became irrelevant. He was a Muslim. He didn't say, <laughs> No way. He didn't say that. Nothing. It was totally irrelevant. He reached out, he dived in, and he saved human beings. What happened? Wallahi, it was acknowledged not only by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but even by everyone else. It changed a lot of perceptions. And there were so many families of people who were affected who rarely would salute any Pakistani because they say these are the people somehow connected to that guy who saved a distant relative of mine the day they were flat. Amazing. Now you tell me, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draw out Europe and say this place, there's not going to be any floods, there's not going to be any, nothing is going to happen to these people at all in terms of what we would call natural disaster. Did that happen? We are prone to anything. Anything could happen. Things could collapse. Something could go wrong. Anything can happen. If we do not understand the levels of unity amongst us, we will never ever be able to survive even for a moment. May Allah grant us goodness. The water that we would be giving one another. You know when we come to Ramadan, mashallah, and I've seen this happening with my eyes. Ramadan, people are compassionate. So, you know, they lay out that little... Uh, tablecloth, mashallah, they put out all the dates and mashallah, sometimes the laban and what else, the zamzam and everything else. And here comes the adhan, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And everyone is now serving each other, brother, take this, my brother, this, my brother, that. You know what? E, we're already calling each other kufa. E, but my brother, you had dates with me throughout the month. I might disagree with you on the day of Eid. Have Eid today, have Eid tomorrow, or don't have Eid, but don't kill each other for Allah's sake. Come on, man. Subhanallah. Amazing. That is why we say, my brothers and sisters, certain things we might not be able to solve them completely. We can have a discussion based on knowledge. Yes, still we may not be able to resolve it. What's the next best? Inshallah, we will be united on all fronts. This particular issue. We don't really see eye to eye, but my brother, I love you. Why? You are my brother in the deen. I want to give you an example. I visited a home. And in that home, I saw, they invited me to a meal. 
and two of the brothers were not eating, they were only having vegetables. And they asked me, you know, mashallah, this is... And then I saw another brother, and he was eating a specific dish on the side. And I saw the father with another two brothers, mashallah, and they were having everything on the table. And I said, what's happening? He says, hey, we have a halal issue here. You know, these two brothers don't eat because it's certified from there. The other one doesn't eat because it's that. And this one here, and I saw this drama live. Life. And I'm sitting there and I'm gulping, thinking, hey, they didn't tell me this before I started eating. I could have interviewed every one of them and I would have known what to eat, what not to eat. Anyway, I did what I had to in terms of staying away from that which you really feel there is a problem with. But to be honest with you, the moral of it, they were living under one roof. They loved each other. They respected each other's difference. Really. Nobody said, you're a kafir, you're this, you're that. No. They used to discuss. I went in and I spoke to them about it and I found out what was going wrong. He says, look, you know what? I don't believe it's stunning. The other guy says, but it's a slight bit of a stun. Then they're asking me, what's your opinion? I told them, I will give you my opinion if you put it down that if I say something, you will accept it. They said, no, we can't do that. <laughs> well, if that's the case, by me giving you an opinion, I'm probably going to come up with a third opinion that will create a bigger division. Leave you where you are, you are two groups. I'd rather not create a third group out of two. SubhanAllah. So I'm looking at them. What I learned so much that, look, these are brothers. I found out they don't do eat on the same day. I found out they don't eat the same food. And I, I found out that they have different people. Obviously, some of them were married. Some of them were not cooking differently in one kitchen for different people. But they respected each other. And they said, look, this food here, these guys will eat it, they won't. So I thought to myself, why don't you use the strictest food so everyone can eat it? The other guy says, this thing tastes better. <laughs> so to me, that's not a logical answer, but that was his mind. I'm sure they would have discussions based on knowledge and one day arrive at some form of unity, inshallah. But for now, they respect one another and they are still discussing the matter. And they will continue discussing it. But they are brothers from one mother and one father. They are living together. They love each other. If there is a fire in the home, they will really take one another out of danger. Although they don't eat the same things. Subhanallah. May Allah grant us goodness. I have also been into homes where some members are not Muslim and others have embraced Islam. Wallahi, the way some of those non-Muslim families respect the Muslims who have or those of their own families who have accepted Islam. We as Muslims do not respect one another. Who have more in common in that way. And I'm telling you this. There are some who revert to Islam. They have a lot of problems. Their families reject them and so on. But there are a lot who revert to Islam. Whose families tell them. Look if that is what you believe is absolutely correct. We support you. Amazing. Look at this open mindedness. Now what I am saying is. We may have differences. We may understand that there are differences. There will always be differences up to the day of Qiyamah. Perhaps, maybe, if Allah wants, the differences may be resolved. But as far as we can see, there will always be differences. However, we need to understand that every common factor we have, we are united regarding those common factors. And there are plenty of them. Like I started with the species with the non-Muslims and now with the Muslims. And the reason why we talk about this, you need to have a genuine feeling in your heart. You need to know how to look at those whom you differ with in opinion. And you need to know how to discuss with them. And you need to know how to talk to them. Because if you want to sideline people solely because they differ with you in three or four things, for example, or perhaps ten things out of a thousand, you know what would happen? A day will come when the non-Muslim will rush to your help quicker than the Muslim. And in Syria itself. In Syria itself. Allahu Akbar. What I'm about to say may make us cry. There are non-Muslims who have reached out in some areas in a bigger way than us to the degree that they have imposed a different religion. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. It's, it's full on the internet. If you'd like to look at it, you can find it. They have imposed a different religion, which has by some people been embraced, whether they did it because they were semi-forced to do it, or wholeheartedly because the Muslims did not reach out to them. That Allah alone knows. I wish it is the former and not the latter. But 
To be honest with you, where are we? We are busy sometimes pointing fingers. This one should do that. What are the big countries doing about it? What are the big people doing about it? Why are these people supporting this group and that group? And in our statements, what's happening? The others are benefiting. And they say, look, why is these people are debating the issue? Let's go through with all our, you know, faith and everything else. And we will make sure that we put forward the mark. As it is, we've got the money and we've got everything. And we are sitting back, pointing fingers. What is that country doing? They should be doing more. These people should be doing this and that. Wallahi, if we keep on saying that, you know what will happen? It reminds me of something. Verse of the Quran. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ إِلَّا تَفْعَلُوهُ تَكُنْ فِتْنَةٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَفَسَادٌ كَبِيرٌ The kuffar are protectors of one another. Really. If you are not going to do the same, there will be great fitna and fasad on earth. There will be chaos and rife. Meaning chaos will be rife on earth. Which means you need to learn to protect one another. You need to learn to bond with one another. You need to know how to treat one another. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May He grant us goodness and may He open our doors. My brothers and sisters, I appeal to you today to be people who are wise, to be people who spread knowledge through peace and wisdom and love. Because if you want to spread the deen through hatred, it is not going to spread. If you think you're on the right path, and you have hatred to the degree that your attitude stinks when it comes to others. Believe me, they will not really see the light in a rush from you. But when you think you're on the right path, one of the signs that you are on the right path is that it calms you down and builds your character and conduct. Taqwallahi comes hand in hand with Husnul Khuluq. The consciousness of Allah is displayed when a person's character is immaculate. One whose character stinks, perhaps their consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only on a specific front. This is why when you talk about taqwa, people see a man with a beard, they say, MashaAllah, this guy is a muttaqi. They see a woman in niqab, they say, oh, MashaAllah, what a pious lady. Piety is not just connected to your external self. That is so simple to do, man. So simple. How many people read salah in the first saf, but they swear at home? They cheat, they are hooked on pornography. They cannot give up illicit relations, but they are in full niqab, subhanAllah. They cannot. Why? Because piety, Allah speaks about it in the Quran, and in one place He uses the term, فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَ kulub. He speaks of something and He says, that shows the true piety of the heart. Piety is in the heart. So, I need to develop internally and externally. There are others whom, sometimes you look at them, and they don't appear to be powerful Muslims, but wallahi, they are more saintly than others who appear to be much more powerful because these have failed and flopped in character and conduct and the others have succeeded greatly in that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to help one another. May He help us to promote whatever goodness we have in a positive way, through wisdom, through peace, through love. And remember, if anyone preaches hatred in a way that you look at others and you feel that this person should not be living, there is something wrong with that preacher. And there is something wrong in what they are preaching. Believe me, that is not the deed. The Prophet wasallam, even at times of war, he was so, so, so much wanting and willing for anyone to turn towards the goodness. Really, that was his main aim. Even if people left the deen, he would try more than once. Or he has asked us to try more than once. To convince this person, what is it that the confusion you have? Talk to us. Let's try and clarify it. Let's see it. But with us, we get upset and angry for the minor issues, the smallest of issues, believe me. And we don't see eye to eye. We draw lines in this direction and that, such that today we have a masjid, for example, and they'll clearly tell you, no, those guys are not Muslims. You know what? Oh, these people, they're not proper Muslims. No, don't go there. No, don't do this. Don't do that. Believe me, like I said, we will continue to remain united for as long as we know that on so many fronts we are united, yet we acknowledge that we are different in five things. Like I say, those five things we will continue to negotiate about them, or should I say, maybe the word negotiation is wrong, but we will express our view 
and we will express why we've said it. You can express yours. You will, ex you will have to express why it happened. And inshallah, we may agree or we may agree to disagree on five matters. That does not mean as an ummah, we are not united. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless myself and yourselves. May He have granted me correctness of my utterance. Whatever I've said that is correct and upright is from, inshallah, the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever I've said that is incorrect is from myself and shaitan. May Allah forgive me. And may Allah grant us all goodness. I say what I've said. Astaghfirullah, I seek Allah's forgiveness. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad subhanallah wa bihamdih. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi. Takbir! Allah!